this just in, um, Donald Trump, uh, truth social, uh, in all caps this morning, uh, uh, stop the protests now with three exclamation points. So that's great. Uh, Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley are talking about let's send in the national guard. We had 21 house Democrats telling, uh, Columbia that you better clear that quad, uh, or else you should resign to, to the uh, chancellor. There, Greg Abbott in Texas uh, is uh, specifically uh, named Students for Justice in Palestine in a March 27th executive order uh, requiring Texas colleges to revise their speech policies to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, there's other uh, uh, suggested ideas from various Congress critters to do similar anti-anti-Semitism bills. Uh, are any of these a good idea? What is your analysis of how uh, politicians are acquitting themselves? I think we do have to give it to Greg Abbott, who has perfectly calibrated a response that uh, will be found to be unconstitutional. Like he really couldn't <laughs> have done it better if he tried. He was like, let me just be super clear. We are not content neutral here. And also the speech that we would like to uh, rule out on public college campuses is definitely constitutionally protected. Um, anti-Semitic speech is gross and disgusting and horrible. Um, and I know I don't have to say that, but also apparently we have to say that. Um, so I'm happy to say it. Gross. Please stop doing this. Please stop saying horrible things about the Jews. That has world historically not ended well and is understandable to me why people are very, very, very sensitive about this. However, it remains constitutionally protected speech, except for in the case that it crosses over into threats. Um, you know, for me, the... Um, you know, it's the it's the kind of showboating that is particularly troubling. Like, at my understanding, at least, uh, I do not remember 1968. Um, but my understanding is that in 1968, this was like mostly the business of the kids. Um, and the idea that we have kind of um, authority figures out here, like in the in the encampments saying I'm on your side or I'm on the other side uh, is not helpful. It's fantastically unhelpful. Um, and it's it's going to make all of the subsequent kind of unraveling of who has been punished rightly and wrongly all the more difficult. And so, all those authority figures think they're channeling the spirit of 1968. Right. Like you can't. But what's crazy is so many of them are like my age. They're like in their mid 40s. They weren't around in 1968 either. This is 1968 envy. It was the end of history when we were in college, as I have said on this podcast before. There was nothing mattered. Lol, nothing mattered. And so I guess maybe people feel like they um, are missing out. Um, finally, I would just say the people whose current plan to deal with this is to do another Kent State should think again. Like that yeah. seems to be a thing that many people well, are in part all was okay. sincerity calling for. And I, I, I just don't think it's going to go well. Call me crazy. You got to say that was the greatest uh, kind of admissions publicity that Kent State could have ever cooked up. Oh, it's the no only reason anybody knows about Kent State. Too soon. Uh, we should probably talk just a little bit about the specific, uh, the, the way that anti-Semitism has, uh, I think, shaped some of the protests and the response to them. Uh, I'm not the first person to come up with an this analogy, but if you think about, uh, if you think about any other group that was... Uh, setting up a camp in the middle of a college campus and then shouting stuff that was like at least borderline, you know, kind of bigoted towards a, another minority group, towards black Americans, towards women, towards anyone that wasn't Jews, right? There would be no question that the that campus authorities would be out there like, you're gone. Like, this is it. This is not happening. This is not okay. Where there's no equivocation. Like, there, there, it's just, there would be a, a universal condemnation. And the fact that campus authorities, uh, that administrators uh, are, are in some cases, uh, you know, participating, encouraging, at least allow, you know, sort of saying, well, you know, this is, this is something we have to think about, I think, um, I think is relevant here. And it's, it is a, it's a different standard for this kind of speech because it is, because it is politically favored on campus. Uh, Nick, I was, I was uh, next to uh, uh, the great Pete Welch yesterday uh, in his, uh, in his room, and he's getting to a, a mental place of magical realism now, which is kind of uh, beautiful to behold. He's a, a Columbia uh, graduate, uh, school graduate, and we were watching CNN, and there's pictures of the quad, and he's looking at it, and he turns to me and says, I cannot determine uh, what it is 
that they're trying to accomplish. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I can tell you they want uh, they want Colombia to divest from yeah. Airbnb. I'm not making right. this up. That's one of their specific demands. It's a uh, boycott, uh, uh, divest, and sanction. I mean, uh, Colombia in particular is one of the hotbeds of not only of post-colonial theory that a lot of this stuff is pulling off of, but the BDS movement, which is uh, you know reminiscent of in the uh, in the mid '80s, the the big campus protest was divestment from South Africa. Uh, they they. Uh, endowment should uh, strip out any companies that did business with South Africa. BDS is a is a more extreme version of that. Uh, what do you think of BDS? Um, is that a good idea? Is that a worthy goal? No, I don't. Well, I you know, there's two ways to think about it. One in general is like, should people you know discipline you know or, or enforce their values through market relationships and things like that? And I think that's you know a, a good idea. That makes a lot of sense when it comes to. Uh, public universities, that becomes a lot more difficult be, or, or public pension funds because all of this stuff has an analog off campus that is ultimately to me much more deeply troubling because it will have a much, much bigger effect on things. Um, but I don't think that the answer to, uh, you know, like if you are mad at Israel is to try and get your college to not, uh, you know, not allow uh, Israeli uh, professors not uh not allow people to go to israeli conferences or not to you know not to allow any of that kind of stuff to put a wall around israel as if it is a uniquely uh you know horrific nation or institution again you can make that decision on your own but it is i think a fundamentally flawed analysis of you know relative merits and demerits of things and i think it shows you know the triumph of sloganeering over anything, uh, anything approaching actual analysis. Uh, you know, on any level that could be considered vaguely intellectual. I also think this is, uh, you know, in um, divestment efforts really hit different when we're talking about colleges that have the kind of endowments that um, these top schools do nowadays. So I think Yale's endowment is like forty billion dollars, right? Um, and, and somehow it's like 10% of Harvard's or something. I, I'm making that up, but it's like somehow yeah, the, much the smaller than are, Harvard's. The numbers are really, really large so much so that like it's a like sort of a cliche joke or whatever to say. Like these are these are like hedge funds or investment firms that like happen to run a college on the side. And um, by accident. And I think that, you know, com compared with the way that that conversation went down in the 80s, you know, we are talking about a quite substantial amount of money. And um, that just raise, raises the stakes for everyone in ways that are like counter synergistic to the project of actually educating students. But the demands that they are making are not even for a direct uh, removal of college funds from something you know directly involved in the Israeli government. For example, I, like I said, they are p calling for um, Colombia to 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 stop their investment in Airbnb, but also in Google. And the reason they want to stop uh, the investment in Google is because Google has a bunch of contracts with the Israeli government. And so it's this two or three steps removed type of demand that it's really hard to imagine that if Colombia followed through on all of this, that it would make a single bit of difference in the actual prospects you know, for the, the the turn of the the war as it is going right now. I'm not saying it wouldn't make any difference in the world at all on anything because it, it is a lot of money. But is this going to stop the war in any way? Is this going to stop anything that you oppose that is happening in Gaza right now? And it's really I, symptomatic both of the students, but also just of the left generally, which has, uh, which just has their their whole mindset is a campus mindset in which everything that matters can be dealt with through by you know by like lobbying campus administrators and that's just not the way the world works it's totally impractical and it's divorced from i think you know it's divorced from real policy and political considerations but also just how normal people live their lives that was a clip from the latest episode of the reason roundtable to watch another clip click here to watch the whole episode click here, and make sure to subscribe to The Reason Roundtable. You'll be glad you did.